Well, I had a number of things on my mind throughout the week. I was thinking about our nation in general. And then I spent time thinking about uh, specifically some individuals within the church and the church as a whole. And really as I was contemplating both the nation around us and even uh, specific Christians, I began to think to myself, why are we in the state that we're in? And really I don't think it could be summed up any better than basically by stating uh, we live in a nation of abomination. And I know that may come across as being a little bit negative, uh, but we do live in a nation which often desires and is filled with abominations. Now, if you wonder what that word abomination means, you can look up the definition, but it will basically tell you that it is a thing that causes or brings hatred. And certainly as we begin to look at the Bible and talk about abominations, we're talking about those things that are disgusted or hated by God. And as sad as the state is for the nation around us and for the church, uh, we're not talking about anything new. We know that as we go back and study throughout time that the followers of God has, have always been surrounded by abominations. I mean, we can even think about the, the fact that you recall when Israel was taken into Babylon, but there were faithful among, among the nation of Israel that had to endure that. But again, this is nothing new. Listen to 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 14. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I was talking with Larry a few minutes before service, Larry Sr. back there, and if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I would have said that abominations and the hatred of God and God's way, it existed, but it, I wouldn't have said that it seemed to me to be increasing at an alarming rate. But if you were to ask me about today, and, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but if you were to ask me about today, it seems to me that the increasing desire and the occurrence and the mission to force sinful ways upon men is, is certainly upon us. And as Larry stated, you know, it's not any different now than, it, than it's always been. And I think he's probably right. But it does seem to me that it, it very, very similar to what Paul states here, it is waxing worse and worse. And that's what Paul said. He said, it's just going to get worse and worse. People are going to deceive others. People are going to be deceived. And he goes on, and it's so simple, guys. He just warns Christians to be faithful. He just warns them to be faithful. Stay away from abominations. And I could have listed a lot of abominations, and there's so many mentioned, but to make things simpler, what we're going to do is we're simply going to pull abominations that are mentioned in the book of Proverbs, and we'll notice that they're still applicable. But go on over to Proverbs 3.32, and we're going to talk for just a few minutes about the perverse person. If you don't know what perverse is, uh, if you look up the definition for that, it is a person who deliberately desires to behave inappropriately. Now let me say this, there are a lot of inappropriate things done that people around us accept and we have to recall there is the world standard and there is God's standard and so they may not be perverse according to the world around us but they may be perverse according to the standard of God. Notice in Proverbs 3.32, for the froward, that word means perverse, for the froward, perverse, is abomination to the Lord but his secret is with the righteous. Now I began to contemplate this passage a little bit. And you may be asking yourself, why is this a secret among the righteous? And I began to think about that. And the reason it is a secret among the righteous is because the unrighteous either don't know it or they don't accept it. How often do you guys ever talk to people who are not Christians and you'll talk about something being a sin and they, they literally do not know that? I mean, to them, it is a secret. They've never studied it. They've never investigated it. We'll touch on that point here a little bit later. Uh, but how many of you guys likewise know people who are perverse who can actually quote the Bible? I've mentioned before there was a gentleman, and this is a great example. He worked with a man for 20 years, and he said he was the most perverse man he'd ever known. He went to a gospel meeting in a nearby community, and guess who was leading prayer there at the church? He was a member of the church the guy didn't even know. Most perverse man he knew was actually a Christian. So we have to recall, we have perverse people out in the world, 
But unfortunately, we know that we have perverse people even within the church. Proverbs 11.20, They that are of a froward, or perverse, heart, are abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are His delight. Now I want to focus in for just a second. He talks about the perverse heart. We know that the heart is the Bible mind, and so we're talking about perverseness that starts within one's mind. The man, the man that we're talking about here, his mind is perverse, and therefore his perverted thoughts lead to perverted ways. And it seems so logical to me, but I'm going to go over to Mark 7 here for just a second. Because we've talked numerous times about how your mind directs your activities in life. Listen to what Jesus says in Mark 7, starting in verse 20. And He said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. From within, out of the heart of men... Let me pause for a second. If you go back to 11 20, remember we're talking about a perverse heart. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. What's he saying? Your thoughts drive your actions. Those clearly with evil thoughts are going to be involved in evil actions. And guys, we have to say this again. The world around us in general is perverse. Now, again, let's remember I'm talking about God's standard, not the world standard. I work with a number of people who are good moral people, who worship with unscriptural organizations, groups, uh, believe that there are certain things that are acceptable, which the world condones. And according to the standard of God, these people are perverse, even though according to our world around us, they may be, appear to be very moral. Now, according to what Paul says, and while the world is perverse and it is getting worse and worse, as Christians who live within this world, we have to find a way to coexist with them while at the same time we remain pure and righteous. We have to be undefiled even though we're surrounded by a nation of abomination. Notice Philippians 2.15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Very clearly we have to be different than those around us. We have to be so pure and righteous according to the Scriptures that we clearly stand out to the world around us. And the Proverbs writer shows that the follower of God is not to in any way indulge in these types of sins that they're involved in. I'm going to go over to Proverbs 3.31, and I'll have to correct a word here. Proverbs 3.31, the Proverbs writer says, Envy thou not the oppressor. Now that word really is not translated very well. Uh, I would translate that word as the unjust or the unrighteous man. Envy thou not the unjust or the unrighteous man, and choose none of his ways. Well, as we've already covered, we have to be different than the world. So we don't indulge in their ways, and we're certainly not envious of their apparent uh, success or popularity in life. Have you guys ever noticed that it seems like those who are famous actually think that their opinion matters to those of us who are out here in the world? Like, we actually care what they have to say. I really could care less what they have to say, right? We need to go back to the Scriptures and realize even if the world considers them to be moral or even if they appear to be successful, that has no influence on what we believe or what we do. Listen to Psalms 37.1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. These people that we're describing here, the ones who are evildoers, the ones in the world around us involved in these different types of abomination, even if accepted by the world around us, their success is nothing really more than a mirage. How many of you guys have ever driven down the road where, as you looked at the hot pavement, it almost looks like there was water in front of you, but there wasn't, right? And the same thing goes with their lifestyle. The fact that they're successful or that they're prominent or whatever, it's nothing more than a mirage. Their prosperity, their worldly success, their fame is really only for a moment. Their appearance of pleasure in this world is really going to be for just a short season. And I'll tell you this, um, there's not going to be any laughing at the judgment for those who are the evildoers or for those involved in uh, abomination. Now go on over to Proverbs chapter 6. This is a passage many of you are familiar with. We're going to actually look at the seven, at the seven abominations and I'll give a few notes on these. 
And ask yourself, as we mentioned these, do we see them prominently in the world around us? Proverbs 6, starting in verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Every one of these things that we look at in this Old Testament passage are actually addressed in New Testament verses. But let's start off talking about a proud look. What's he talking about here? He's talking about uh, haughtiness, uh, those who are conceited of themselves, which is really based solely on contempt for others or looking down on others. And it's interesting that as God mentions here through the inspired scriptures seven things that he hates, he starts off with pride. You guys notice pride is really the base for all, all sin. Uh, it's the pride that actually causes man to reject God's word. He mentions a lying tongue. Now, we don't need to spend much time on this. It is fairly simple. Uh, lying is holy for the purpose to deceive other people or to either uh, hide sin. The Bible teaches that there isn't anything any more sacred than truth. As a matter of fact, it's only through truth that a man can be saved or, or remain in a saved situation. 1 Timothy 2.4, and we could give a, no, a number of other passages. And so a lying tongue, again, is, a, is an abomination, just as bad as one who is prideful. He then mentions hands that shed innocent blood. Now, I find this interesting. If you talk to most people and you ask them, what are your thoughts on murder? I think the majority of people in the United States, a nation of abomination, would tell you murder is wrong. And yet, if you'll go back and do any type of study whatsoever, you'll find that murder is currently legal within our United States. And if you go back and actually do the math since Roe versus Wade, just under 60 million innocent babies have been murdered in the womb. But it's not just that. We are in a, a nation of abomination. I looked up the statistics on just murder in general, not considering abortion. Did you guys know that about 16,000 people are murdered every year in the United States? Now, we've talked about that before, but if you go back and look up the reasons for murder, every one of these revolves around sin. Usually, it usually revolves around money. But guys, we live in a nation that constantly sheds innocent blood. He then mentions a heart with wicked thoughts, and I'll touch on this a little bit more in another point. Uh, many today are just filled with the desire to be involved in pure wickedness. It's what they think about all the time, and it really ties into the very next thing mentioned here in Proverbs, which is feet that are swift in running to evil. seems very logical to me that if you're constantly thinking about evil things, you're going to be much quicker to be involved in these types of evil things. He then talks about a false witness. I think most of us know what this is. It's a person who takes an oath or affirms to tell the truth, and then they lie about somebody else. Uh, and as I thought about this, this is really deceit and betrayal at its worst. Anybody that would affirm to tell the truth about somebody, but then they'll tell what clearly they know is a lie. Then he mentions this one, one who sows discord among brethren. I began to think about this. How many of you guys have ever in your physical families had discord? That is a bad thing. And as bad as that is, I'm going to tell you this, discord amongst the followers of God, that is even worse. Because as you think about us as followers of God, we're supposed to be united and supportive of one another, clearly for the purpose of edification. All of these things are abominations to God. Guys, And all of these things are still happening today. Let's notice another abomination mentioned in Proverbs. Go over to Proverbs 11.1. 1. He mentions the false balance. Uh, if you're not familiar with a balance, the best picture I could give you, how many of you guys have ever seen Monty Python Quest for the Holy Grail? Just nod your head. If you don't know what a balance is, there's a scene in there where he's actually weighing a woman as compared to the weight of a duck in order to determine whether or not she's a witch. Right? So you guys know what I'm talking about, the big scale, right? You've got, the idea is you put a standard on one thing and you weigh something next to it, right? Notice Proverbs 11.1. 1. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. Okay, so uh, quite often where I work and in my field, we will calibrate gauges. The way that works is, is I have, a, I have a known standard. I use that to make sure that my gauge reads exactly to the standard. And when that works correctly, I know I'm getting an accurate measurement. He begins to talk about those who have a false balance. They're using a false standard to offset the scale. Uh, 
Why is it false? Well, they're cheaters. They're liars. What they're doing is, is they're stealing, right? Listen to Proverbs 20.10. Diverse weights and diverse measures, both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. Now, if you go back and try to figure out what the Proverbs writer is telling us, the balance was really the equivalent of what today we call the scale, right? So if I go to the store and I buy, uh, I buy a half pound of pork, uh, but when the guy weighs it, it says a half pound, but I only get a quarter because he's offset the scale. What he's doing is, is he's lying to me in order to steal money, right? That's what he is talking about. And so as we begin to put this in a, a more general aspect, He's pointing out that it's an abomination to be involved in any type of a dishonest business practice or any type of uh, shady dealing in general regarding business. It would be wrong for me in any regard within, within my business or my role as what I do to deceive other people uh, to steal from them. We've got to remember the basis of the follower of God, as we've already mentioned here, is truth and righteousness. Everything regarding the Christian is to be based on truth, even our dealings with those in the world around us. Now let's talk about another one. Going over to Proverbs 15.9. Now this one, I just titled this as wickedness. Wickedness in general. And certainly all of the abominations we're looking at are wickedness. But here he brings this out in such a way that, that we get an understanding that there's a lot included in this. Proverbs 15.9. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Now, you may be asking, well, you talk about the way of the wicked, but I'm not really sure what is the way of the wicked as opposed to the way of the righteousness. How do you learn about righteousness? Well, we go to the Scriptures, don't we? And so we get the understanding that anything that contradicts the Bible would be wicked, even if the world around us would consider it to be morally good or acceptable. I won't spend much time on it, but, but again, when you talk to people in the religious world around us, what is the general mindset regarding all religions. For the most part, they look at them as all being acceptable to God, correct? And yet we learn here that uh, because it is directly opposed to the Scriptures where we learn about righteousness, even that's considered wickedness. We know that all wickedness is an abomination to God, and yet, as I thought about this, you know that we oftentimes within the church associate wickedness just with those of the world. And yet, as we look here in the book of Proverbs, we find that wickedness is sadly even seen oftentimes among the follower of God. Listen to, I'm going to go back one passage or one, one verse, Proverbs 15, 8. Notice this, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Now, wait, let that pause for just a second. You've got wicked people sacrificing. You might be asking, why would, why would wicked people sacrifice or worship? Let's go to Proverbs 21, 27. We learn the same thing. <clears throat> the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more then he bringeth it with a wicked mind? So you've got people here involved in worship. Specifically, he talks about sacrifice. And then he says, some of these people are bringing this sacrifice with a wicked mind. Again, why would the wicked people sacrifice? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, you might have people who claim to be followers of God who are not really followers of God. And two, the other reason is, is because, guys, we even have those who are followers of God who are sometimes involved in sin. And as I began to think a little bit about this, I began to think specifically of King Saul over in Samuel 15. I'm not going to go over there. But many of you are familiar with this, where Saul thought that he could come and he could offer sacrifices. And what he learned really quick was, not all sacrifices were acceptable to God. And it was the same back in Isaiah's day for the nation of Israel. Listen to Isaiah 1.11. And this might confuse some people, but I'll help clear it up. He says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. Now, some would say, now I'm confused. How is it that the Lord is not delighting in their, in their sacrifices when the Lord demanded that they sacrifice? And here's the reason. Yeah, they were commanded to sacrifice, but you know what else? They were also required to be faithful, but they weren't doing that. And so here you've got men, and it takes me back to Proverbs 21, 27, who are offering sacrifice, but yet they have a wicked mind. Listen to Hosea 6, 6. 
For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. We're talking about where the mind is in relation to that worship. Physical sacrifices or worship, they don't mean anything if a, person's, if a person is not pure before God. There are a lot of people or groups today who are worshiping. And as I thought about that, here would be my question. Do they find themselves in the same situation as Israel? Where indeed they are offering sacrifice, or they are indeed offering worship, and yet because they're not pure before God, it's not accepted. Instead, it is looked at really as an abomination. Let's carry that mindset over to the prayer of the wicked, which is also an abomination. Listen to Proverbs 28, 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, now specifically here we're talking about the law of Moses in context, even his prayer shall be abomination. Now, I'm not going to go back and read the verse, but jot down Isaiah 59, 2. We know that God does not hear the prayer of sinners. We talked about this not too long ago in a lesson mandating or verifying that we would go back and check ourselves before we offered prayer to even make sure that we're in a position where it can be heard. God makes it very clear that He doesn't listen to those who are in a position of sin. He doesn't hear their prayers. Now, you might ask the question, why would you have sinful men praying? Well, if sinful men offer sacrifices, wouldn't it seem also logical to you that sinful men at some times may offer prayer? Again, think about all of the religious groups around us. I know for a fact that many of those groups totally contradict a number of things in the Bible, and yet all of those groups, I'm sure, are offering prayer to God. Here we learn that the prayer of the wicked is considered abomination. Uh, and have you guys noticed this? There are a lot of people today who think that, that prayer just cures everything for everybody. Uh, they think they can go about throughout their week, they can do whatever they want, think whatever they want, say whatever they want, do whatever they want, and just a little talk with Jesus makes everything all right. That's not what we find according to the Scriptures. Now let's talk about the thoughts of the wicked here for just a minute. And I have to point something out because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding here. Uh, it's just as bad to think about something incessantly nonstop than it is to actually do it. I've actually heard people say, well, you know, you really ought not to think about it, but it's not technically bad until you do it. Before I give this example, and let me just say I have not done this, but what would you think if you found out that all throughout the week, all I did was think about was committing adultery on my spouse. And again, I have not done that. <laughs> I have not. But what would you think about that? Would you think those evil thoughts were acceptable before God? Remember I said that people that think evil thoughts oftentimes find themselves, we talked about having feet quick to run to mischief. What we learn here is it's, it's not simply okay to think about it, but just not do it. Listen to Proverbs 15:26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Again, what's the idea here? Wicked thoughts lead to wicked actions. Those people who sit around and think about whatever type of wickedness this may be, oftentimes, again, find themselves involved in wickedness. It leads to sin in one's personal life. Guys, this even carries over to sin in one's worship. Listen to 1 John 3, 4, and this will help summarize what sin is. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, that's where some, I think, struggle. They say, well, it's, okay. it's not okay to commit adultery, but if you just thought about it, that's not that bad. Or it's, okay to, it's not okay to steal, but if I'm just thinking about it, it's not that bad. Let me, let me tell you about a gentleman I knew. This gentleman was a recovering uh, gambling addict. Uh, and he had a serious problem with gambling, and he had not gambled in about, from my recollection, it had been about six or seven years. But you know what's interesting? He would still buy books on techniques for gambling and how to, be, how, to, how to gamble, and he would read books incessantly. You guys know what he eventually started doing again? He went back to gambling. He had a serious problem. But it was interesting, as I talked to him, he said, yeah, I haven't gambled in six years, but it's all he thought about. It's all that he ever thought about. And guys, I'm not surprised when I found out that he went back to gambling again. We learn here that transgressing the law of God leads to a number of sins, so many so that we couldn't really cover them all if we preached only on different sins for every Sunday of the year. We still couldn't cover all of these in great detail. So here's, here's a logical question. Why did the wicked transgress the law of God? 
why do even members of the church transgress the law of God? Here, I think, is the basic reason. Those who are involved in this type of wickedness, they don't study. For the most part, those involved in this type of wickedness, they couldn't answer to you, according to God's will, why it is that what they do is sinful. Uh, they like it. They do it. Uh, and they really don't know much about what the Bible teaches on it. And I'll, I'll take this another step forward. How many have you, of you, and I have, have seen recently supposed ministers or pastors, as they'll call them, who teach things like abortion, homosexuality, fornication, whatever it might be, are acceptable. I noticed a couple of different articles I read this week uh, of, pro or of pro-choice ministers. Let that sink in for a minute. Pro-choice ministers. Do you believe they actually have a group for that? Uh, I began to think a little bit about it. I don't know what book they follow, but they don't follow the same book I follow uh, if they're okay with killing innocent children. But there are people who are involved in this type of stuff, and here's what I get. They clearly don't study the Bible. They don't have answers as to why these things are evil. And guys, that's, that's not my opinion. Listen to Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. Guys, there are many people who claim to be Christians today who don't even have basic knowledge regarding the New Testament. I'm talking about the one faith, the one church, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Uh, there are so many things that, are, that we within the congregation here look at as just basic, fundamental Bible teaching. And yet you'll talk to those who claim to be Christians who have no idea whatsoever. Now let's focus for just a minute on this one. And, and this isn't me attacking the nation around us. What you're going to find is, is me talking about even followers of God. Leaders who commit wickedness, they are an abomination. Listen to Proverbs 16, 12. It is an abomination to kings to commit wickedness, for the throne is established by righteousness. All leaders are supposed to be uh, upright and moral examples. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. They're not. They're just not. But they're supposed to be. And here's a good example. I'm going to use King Herod if you go on over to Acts 12. And you might ask yourself, why would he do this? Acts 12, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. And then were the days of unleavened bread... And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarternons of soldiers to keep him, intending after, that word should be Passover, if you have Easter in your Bible, that, that's not Easter, it's Passover, intending after Passover to bring him forth to the people. So, all right, he killed James. He wants to kill Peter, and here's the question, why? Because he could, because he's in a position of authority, he can do whatever he wants, and he wants to vex or persecute the church. Listen to 2 Timothy 3.12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. John 15.8. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, we're not just talking about worldly leaders, guys. We could go back and we could look at a number of, of leaders. We could think about, as we've already mentioned, Saul. We could think about King David. Many of them who were who were followers of God, leaders of the nation, who were involved in sin. It saddens me to say it or even think about it, but the leaders of our nation are really no different than Herod. They have the right to make immoral laws. They have the right to persecute us as Christians, even though we are righteous, and they do. They lie. They cheat. They steal. They make immoral laws. And guess what, guys? They usually get away with it. And here's what, here's what we notice as we go back. What did they do to Herod? Nothing. They didn't do anything to Herod. Just know most of our immoral leaders, and we may even have leaders within the church, specifically talking about elders, who may be involved in different types of sin. And oftentimes in the world, they'll get away with it. Now let's talk about a false sense of morality. I had to kind of summarize this one up. False senses of morality are an abomination to God, and it works two ways. There are those who justify wickedness, and there are those who will condemn the just. And we've seen this time and time again, and we've even covered these passages. But Proverbs 17, 15, 
He that justifieth the wicked, we're talking about sin. How many of you guys have seen people out holding up uh, pro-abortion signs, right? They're justifying sin. And he that condemneth the just, how many of you have seen a, a faithful brother or sister in Christ attacked because of their faith? Even they both are an abomination to the Lord. It's not any better to justify the wicked than it is to condemn the just. Both of those, both of those things are an abomination. Listen to Isaiah 5.20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. How could they do that in our nation today? I think the simple answer again is, is we live in a nation of abomination. The prominent religious world around us, they have it all wrong, and you guys have heard this all too often. They, they're very quick to quote, uh, judge not to those who will condemn the wicked. They're very quick to talk about how we're intolerant to accept their erroneous teachings or sinful ways, and yet they are not tolerant to accept our beliefs. And many hold those who justify wickedness in high esteem. And you may say, what do you mean? Let me give you one example. I saw it again this week, and I'm going to tell you guys, I don't know if this is the correct term, it is a pet peeve of mine, and it drives me crazy. I saw a brother in the church again this week posting Francis Chan on Facebook. And guys, you realize the religious world around us holds Francis Chan in high esteem? I have studied what Francis Chan teaches. Francis Chan does not believe in a number of fundamental doctrines. He doesn't believe in the one church as we understand it. He doesn't believe in a number of these things. And he's held in high esteem. That's according to the world. But if you were to look at the description for Francis Chan according to the Word of God, you would find he is a false teacher. What he is involved in and what he does is an abomination to God. And all wickedness and those who promote it are an abomination to God. So let's summarize it this way. We know that some of these things are acceptable to men, but we know that they are abominations to God. And so here's the question. In any of these things that we've just mentioned today, are we involved in any of these things or support any of these things that would be considered an abomination to God? Now, as I draw this to close, my concern is always the same. It's that for those who may be here or watching this, that you are a faithful follower of God, meaning you've obeyed the gospel uh, and you're living faithful. Or two, uh, you're living faithful as a Christian and you're striving to go out and to teach others about it. Let's go back to the person who's not yet obeyed the gospel. It is not very complicated. It's not, uh, it's not something that you can teach in just one verse. I know that's the primary religious world around us. They teach faith-only ideas. Please go back and look at the conversion accounts. It's always the same. Someone is teaching the gospel. People believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They were willing to repent of their sins, willing to confess Christ, willing to be immersed in water for the remission of their sins. Not a very complicated process. They heard it. They believed it, they confessed Him, and they were immersed. And when they did that, they were added to the church. Now, if you're watching this online or if you're here and you've never heard that, let me sit down. I will give you all of the verses. And there's a number of other things I would want you to know about also, about the fact that there is one church, there is one faith, that we're in unity one with another. There's a whole host of things you need to understand to become a Christian. If you're here or if you're watching this and you've not done that, contact us via email, by phone, however. If you are here and you are a Christian, again, go back and think about your week. Think about the things you've been involved in or the things you've thought about and ask yourself, have they been pure or would they be considered an abomination to God? As I draw this to a close, if there's any way we can help you, you can come forward as we're led in a song of invitation.